Okay, so now you can start. Sorry. And thank you very much for the kind introduction and for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. It's really a great pleasure to present uh, our work. Um, so today I would like to talk about my work on non-emission topology. If you're not familiar with the field or the notion of topology, then don't worry because I'll start from the beginning and introduce the important concepts. Um, one sp thing in specifically, specific that I'm very much interested in are phenomena that are associated with topology. And the phenomenon that we will see um, appear throughout this talk, um, which is really key to understanding what happens in non-emission systems, non-emission topological systems, is the phenomenon of directional amplification. Now, what does that mean? So imagine we have a system which has some input or an output ports, and we send in some drive signal to probe the response of the system. Then directionality or non-reciprocity means that the signal is transmitted in one direction. But if we send in a signal from the opposite direction, then the signal is blocked or strongly attenuated. Now, if we combine this with amplification, then we see that directional amplification means that in the forward direction, the system is amplifying, while in the reverse direction, it blocks the signals. And as you can imagine, this is actually highly sought after for applications. So for example, in quantum information processing applications, um, this, this this can come in very useful because you can read out very fragile sources while protecting the source against noise or backscattering. So imagine you want to read out a superconducting qubit, then the uh, direction amplification would allow you to do this while making sure that your qubit is not tampered with. Okay, so this is what a direction amplification is about. So what about topology? And here, let's start at the beginning. Um, to, in mathematics, topology characterizes um, properties of geometric shapes. And a very famous example in topology, um, especially when physicists talk about this, is the so-called genus. And here you can see a, as an illustration of the genus. Um, the genus basically just counts the number of holes in a two-dimensional surface. So a ball would have a genus of zero, whereas a torus or a cup both have a genus of one, because you can deform one into the other without tearing any holes into it or patching any holes. Um, however, this is distinct from a two torus and so on. And so it, this is really a global property of, of your shape. And the remarkable thing is that um, many complex physical systems can actually be understood in terms of some underlying topological topology that arises in the description. And very famous is the quantum hole effect um, in, that is, has been extensively studied over uh, in condensed matter physics. Um, the re so for example, in, in some materials, when you put them in a magnetic field and you measure the resistance on, along a certain axis, you will see that the resistance is quantized. And you see these, this in these uh, discrete steps. And these discrete steps are actually due to a topological invariant. So actually the measurable response of the system only depends on the topological properties of the system and some fundamental constants. So it doesn't actually depend on the microscopic details of the model. Another really interesting thing that is associated with topologic, topology in physical, uh, in condensed matter systems are the so-called edge states. So here you can see an example in two dimensions. Um, where the state localizes only at the system edge. And this is even robust to defects. So for example, here the crystal is not perfect, but still you have an edge state. And because of these very interesting uh, properties and, and really uh, yeah, the robustness and these edge states, a lot of uh, effort has been devoted to recreating these topological systems, these topological insulators, how they are called, in other settings, such as photonics. And this has given rise to the field of, of topological photonics. So for example, um, one could imagine combining photonic crystals with different topological invariants. And at the interface, you will see that light uh, will be confined and you can actually use this to guide light through um, your photonic crystal. You could also um, use the edge state and combine this with some um, amplification process such as tumult squeezing. And then you can imagine building traveling wave amplifiers which are robust against disorder and, and backscattering. Or you can pump the edge and then you end up with a topological laser. However, all of these systems have in common that they are no longer closed systems. Remember, we came from condensed matter systems, uh, electronic systems, but now these systems all exhibit losses, and in some cases even gains, such as the amplifier or the laser. 
So now we can ask what happens to the topology um, in the presence of gain and loss? Um, or is there even a new notion of topology in the presence of gain and loss? And that is exactly the idea behind this field of non-emission topology. You take a system that is that is losses that can ex ex experience gain and loss. You define an object that is effectively non-emission. You will see how you, this can be done in a second. And then you ask uh, about mathematical properties of this non-emission object and how can this be connected to something that we can measure. So how can this be done? So that's you're probably familiar with uh, master equation, the master equation to model um, open quantum system. One um, approach that can be employed here is to write down the master equation. So here you have the coherent um, part of the evolution, and here you have the part that models gain and loss. So these L, these jump operators, they could model um, losses from the system or, or gain or um, any other kinds of um, engineered dissipation, <coughs> which we will see some examples later on. And you can reorder those terms such that you end up with the right-hand side of this equation. Um, and then you will, you see that first you have this um, evolution here under some effectively non-emission uh, operator. Um, so you, you get this anti uh, this commutator here. Except, well, except it's not an, an, a commutator because you have the dagger here. And then you get the jump term. And then some people say that if you monitor your evolution, so you, you basically look at the conditional evolution, you make sure that no jump has occurred, then you can study the evolution as if it had only evolved under this effective non-emission operator. But as you can imagine, this requires some special care because you have to monitor and make sure you only select the trajectories when a jump has occurred. So there is another approach. And this is the approach I will be adopting here. We can take the master equation and then we can um, calculate expectation values for field operators. So imagine you have a system of cavities that are coupled and then these A operators describe your cavity fields. And then you look at the uh, evolution equation of expectation values. And if your Hamiltonian was bilinear in your um, operators and the, uh, mass, um, the dissipators were linear, then you end up with a linear equation of motion for your mean fields. And we also include another contribution here, which is our drive or our probe, um, and to which we ultimately record the system response. So this is what we will be looking at here, and you will see a ex concrete example um, right, right away. So now we, we have understood how um, we can arrive at some effective non-emission object. Here we've introduced this in form of this matrix, is non-emission matrix H. Um, which we also call dynamic matrix. So now let's understand how we can um, engineer non-emission systems or where we actually find interesting um, dynamics. And in the, in the same context, we will also understand where non-reciprocity and directional amplification come from. So let's start from a very simple system. Um, here, this is a system of three cavities that are coupled or simply bosonic modes that are coupled via hopping. So, and um, the crucial thing to observe here is that there's actually a phase difference between the, the hopping here at the top and the hopping via this auxiliary mode C. So here the phase is included here in this hopping. And because of this phase difference, this actually means that there can be interference, constructive and destructive interference, depending on which direction you hop. Um, and we will see this now in the equation of motion. Uh, very clearly. But first, let us assume that this mode C is very lossy. So we can actually eliminate them ad adiabatically from the equations of motion. And that actually gives rise to a so-called non-local dissipator that we can plug in onto our master equation. So you see that essentially what it means is you can hop from one to two, but then there's also a chance of uh, decay. And then here, the phase difference is encoded here as well. OK, so what do the equations of motion look like? Um, so for the mean fields. So here first we have some local losses, which come both from the local dissipation that we automatically assume because we want to probe the system and couple waveguides to the system, so this induces losses. Um, and on the other hand, we also have local losses from the non-local dissipator. And then we have the coherent coupling to the, to between um, that uh, facilitates the coupling between the two modes. But we also have the dissipative coupling. And here we, we notice that actually the, the phase now enters with a different sign. So this makes it possible for us to create this interference that I talked to you about. 
and by specifically by setting theta equal to pi over two and j equal to gamma half, we can actually eliminate the coupling from one of these equations completely. So um, A1 is now completely isolated from anything that happens in, um, in, uh, in mode two, but mode two is driven by what happens in mode one. And this is um, even more clearly visible from the scattering matrix, which now connects our drive or our probe field to the output, sorry, to the output. Um, this is so this is the scattering matrix. And with a suitable choice of parameters, actually the scattering matrix takes a very simple form. So here you can see that actually anything that comes from cavity one is transmitted to cavity two, but <coughs> not versa. So this is a very uh, simple example for a so-called isolator that was already proposed in this very nice paper by Anja Mittelmann and Ash Clark. So if you're interested in this type of physics, then I would recommend you have a look at this paper. And now we make a modification to the system. We introduce an incoherent pump. So that you can imagine that um, if you're asking about the physics behind an incoherent pump, you could imagine that you get an incoherent pump simply by coupling to another mode via two mode squeezing, which is also lossy. And when you eliminate them from the equations of motions, this basically looks like anti-damping. Or in the master equation, you could write it as a dissipator of a dagger. Now everything else stays the same. So the only thing that, oh sorry about this. So the only thing that happens is that in the scattering matrix, we replace the unit transmission by the square root of an amplification gain. So now we actually have a minimum model for a directional amplifier where we can tune the non-reciprocity and the gain independently. So we can, the non-reciprocity is tuned by theta, the gain is, in, is tuned by kappa. So now let's ask what happens when we scale this up and we combine multiple such um, minimal directional amplifiers to a chain of length n. Um, and we can do the same thing again. We can write down the equations of motion only that now we have um, a left neighbor and a right neighbor. And we see already here that there's this asymmetry that we saw before as well. So now when we write this in this more abstract form of a matrix vector multiplication, our dynamic matrix H is clearly non-emission. And so to understand this, what happens now with the scattering response in general, we need to understand uh, our dynamic matrix better. Or to be more specific, we need to understand the inverse of the dynamic matrix, because you see this is how the scattering matrix is de defined. It's essentially the inverse. Or if you're more used to working with Green's function, then this contribution here, you can also say that this is the Green's function of the system. And by the way, this system was also nicely discussed in Diego's work, um, which I'd like to mention here. So if you would like to see get another uh, view on this, then I would also recommend that you check out his paper. So now how can we understand this? Um, so here we can do the same thing as you would do in a condensed matter system. You can go to periodic boundary conditions and because we assume translational invariance, the system is actually diagonal in a plane wave basis. And what we find is that because of the translational invariance, actually the spectrum falls on a closed curve, um, this closed curve H of K. And this closed curve, this actually, it, it opens up a loop which is due to the non-homisticity of the system. And now we can use this loop to define a winding number, which will now be our topological invariant in the system. And we basically just count how many times H of K winds around the origin. So this uh, line would wind once, the other two, they don't wind at all. And what we've been able to prove is that when you go now from periodic back to open boundary conditions, then a non-zero uh, winding number is in one-to-one -one correspondence with directional amplification. And this has actually a very intuitive, um, uh, so while we prove this rigorously in the paper, this has also a very intuitive um, explanation. So because we have to sort of fill two requirements to get a non-trivial winding number. So first we have to open up this loop and it is actually quite straightforward to show that this loop opens up when we have a non-vanishing theta, when we have non-reciprocity in the system. So that's the first ingredient. The other ingredient is that we require some positive imaginary part of our eigenvalues in order to encircle the origin. But actually that means that the system is dynamically unstable under periodic boundary conditions. 
So now if we um, think about what this means is under periodic boundary conditions, this means that actually the um, excitations would hop around this ring um, with a preferential direction, so in a, a directionally, and the um, field amplitude would grow exponentially with time. But now when we go to open boundary conditions, we remove one of these links, so this motion can't continue, and actually excitations pile up at one end of the system, and this is what we can extract as directional amplification from the system. And the good news is also that in many cases, this is actually dynamically stable. So even although the periodic boundary condition case was unstable, the open boundary conditions case will be stable. So the way we show this in the paper is that we actually derive a decomposition for the scattering matrix, where we identify um, one the, this as the dominant contribution, and then there are some small corrections. And um, in particular, the scattering matrix consists of um, the square root of an amplification gain, which determines uh, basically your gain, and then a set of functions which shapes the uh, which shapes the matrix. And you can see that there is the striking feature in the scattering matrix when in topologically non-trivial regimes is this dominant matrix corner, which corresponds to end-to-end -end amplification. So if you were to inject a signal at the nth side, for example, then you would end up at the first side with this large gain. Whereas when you change the sign of the winding number, it's actually the opposite way around. And what we've also been able to derive, and this is really the key signature of topology here, is that the gain grows exponentially with the system size. So the size of this element here is grows exponentially. On the other hand, the reverse gain, so this would correspond to the uh, opposite end of, of your, or the opposite matrix corner of the scattering matrix, um, the reverse gain is exponentially suppressed, and at a special point, namely the exceptional point, it is actually exactly zero. From this, we also recover the limiting case of n equals 2 that I started from. So by just setting n equals 2, we recover this, um, this very simple form. So that is actually also contained in this framework. So this is again how what this what this would look like um, in a topologically non-trivial uh, phase. So so we would inject a signal here at the end side, and we get a large response at the other end. And in fact, this response grows exponentially across the system. On the other hand, now in the trivial case, um, we actually get the largest response close to where we sent in our probe signal. So, and, and then there's actually an exponential decay across the system. So here you can see this again in a topological phase diagram so that you really see that, uh, that this is actually a phase diagram for the scattering response of the system. And actually the phase diagram is only defined in terms of two parameters here. It's the ratio between the dissipative coupling and local dissipation. So that would be the, the strength of this uh, non-local dissipator that I showed you before and the non-reciprocal phase. Um, in particular, we obtain these two phases where the mining number is uh, non-zero, and you can see this typical form of the scattering matrix here with the dominant matrix corner, and there's also a large gain associated with it, um, while all the rest is trivial. And you can see that we can still have non-reciprocity in the system, so the scattering matrix can still be asymmetric, as you can see here, but there is no meaningful gain, um, or in some special cases, so when the theta is pi or zero, actually the scattering response is symmetric. So we are, the, there's, this is what we would call reciprocity. And then I also mentioned dynamic stability, which is of course very important if we want to actually build a device out of this. Um, anything that is to the left of the gray line is stable. So there's actually a very nice overlap between the stable regime and the topologically non-trivial regime, which is what we would want for applications. We also invest. Clara, so, uh, sorry, yes. one question. Sure. But, uh, yeah. uh, when you put there the exceptional point, why there? There is no amplification. You said the gain was uh, one. Ah, no, the, yeah, there is gain. Uh, there is amplification at the exceptional point. It's just that, um, so you're probably asking about this. Oh, this zero. Ah. Yeah, this is the the opposite uh, corner. So this is what goes into the reverse direction. So if ah. you look at an exceptional point, then you would just find that what you get in the reverse direction is exponentially small. But if you're exactly at the exceptional point, it is uh, independent of system size and it's exactly zero. So this is very nice if you want to build a device, for example. 
Um, uh, ah, is this the, like the optimal point? You say? Yeah, it's, it's uh, exactly. But you see, if, if you make your system larger, then it actually de doesn't matter so much because then, you know, it becomes exponentially small. And so typically in experiments, you wouldn't hit zero exactly anyway. And so then, um, yeah, uh, that so then it, it doesn't actually become that important anymore. It's also interesting to note that the exceptional point is not necessarily associated with non trivial topology because you see, the phase diagram is only um, defined in terms of dissipative coupling and non-reciprocity. But the exceptional point for that, also the coherent coupling matters. And actually, you can move around this exceptional point. So you could move it into the trivial regime. Then you would have isolation. So you would have non-reciprocal transmission, but you wouldn't have actually have amplification. So you have a little bit of freedom with the exceptional point here. So you mm. can use it in the way that works best for you. And how you define the exceptional point? In that case. Uh, so that uh, yeah the, ex uh, the exceptional point is um, you know just for everyone is is when the all of the eigen or, um, when multiple eigenvectors coalesce and so in, in our case it's actually very easy to see because um, actually our dynamic matrix then has already Jordan block form so then it's very easy to see that this should be an exceptional point of order n and this happens when actually when the coherent coupling and the dissipative coupling interfere destructively, perfectly destructively, because then you in, you completely remove the coupling to one direction. You only hop in one in, in one direction. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so this is it's actually very straightforward to see. Um, I see. So yeah, oh. you can basically see this from, from this already here. You see here you only couple to you couple only in one direction. So this is now a try if you write it in matrix form, it's a triangular matrix. So that already kind of shows you that that this that there should be exception, an exceptional point here. You can also see it in the sketching matrix. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Thank you. Very clear. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Feel free to interrupt me with questions if you have any. I'm happy to answer throughout. It's better to um, ask right away. Okay, so then the next thing that we, we were interested in is the robustness against disorder. Because if you think about emission systems, one of the very... Um, yeah, one of the key advantages of, of working with the topological emission system is their robustness against this order. But a priori, we don't know anything about what happens in this system. So, um, and we found actually a very uh, clear picture that explains what happens. Um, so without this order, the spectrum of our, of our system under periodic boundary conditions falls on this green dashed line here. And now we assumed disorder that is bounded, but that's just for the calculations. We can also extend this to more general settings. Um, so, and when the disorder is bounded, then what we can show is that now the spectrum of any disordered realization falls in this green um, region here that I sketched, where this W is, your dis is the disorder strength. Now this could be local disorder, but it also dis extends to disorder and the couplings, for example. And now what we've been able to show is that when the bounds of the, this region um, do not cross the origin. So in this case, for example, the, the green um, bound is still um, to the right side of the origin. So it would have, if we were to calculate the winding number for the bound, it would have the same winding number as the green dashed line. Then when this is the case, then we can be sure, even though we cannot define a winding number for the disordered system, that the response that we get always corresponds to um, the one that we would get in a non-trivial system. So we would see this directional amplification across the system. On the other hand, when the disorder is too strong, so that the inner bound in this case has moved across the origin, then we can't be sure. So in some cases, we will actually sample something that looks like a trivial response, so like the response of a trivial system. But in other cases, we would get lucky and still find the directional amplification. So this gives us actually a very nice criterion to decide whether a system, well, basically to say how robust the system is. And also we can influence this separation between the spectrum and the point uh, and, the, and the origin to make sure that um, it's, the system is sufficiently robust against disorder. And so in some sense, this minimal separation here somehow replaces the notion of a gap um, that we know from mission systems. So if you have a mission system then, and you have a mid gap state that lives in the in the band gap then actually the amount of disorder that is tolerated is given by the size of your band gap so somehow this is reminiscent of that 
Okay, so now um, we have two things. We've got an, a signature of trivial non-emission topology, namely directional amplification, and we've seen that it is robust against disorder. So this actually um, primes it for experiment experiments, and that's exactly what we did in collaboration with the group of Ewald Verhagen and um, Amsterdam. Um, but we realized the different system, not the one that I showed to you, but it um, can be understood in terms of the same framework. And the system that we looked at is um, the so-called bosonic key type chain, which was introduced by Alexander McDonald and Ash Clark in this very nice paper here. And it's actually a it's actually um, Hermitian system, but when you write the equations of motion, we can identify non-Hermitian dynamics. So this system combines hopping and two-mode squeezing. Um, as you can see, and when we now go into a quadrature representation of this and write the equations of motion for the field quadratures, we actually find that these equations of motion decouple. And what's more is that the you see these this the dynamic matrix is essentially the transpose. Uh, they are the transpose of each other. So what that uh, <clears throat> while each of these dynamic matrices, both for the p and the x quadrature, are non-Hermitian and can be thought of just as the um, dynamic matrix that I talked about in the previous part. <clears throat> now, um, what that means is actually that if we look calculate the Y numbers separately for the X and P quadratures, then we find that they have opposite sign. So what this means in terms of um, the scattering response is that we obtain directional amplification, but now in opposite directions for the X and the P quadrature. And this is what we could see in experiment. Now, the uh, experiment that Ewald Verhagen's group uh, did was based on um, these silicon nanobeams. Um, they, they, they have um, that this is an optomechanical system. So they have these silicon nanobeams. They are really small. You can see here on the order of a couple of micrometers. Um, they have certain vibration eigenmodes. And here you can see the different um, eigenmodes, so the dif different deformations of this nanobeam. And these occur at different frequencies. And so the, on the other hand, um, this uh, nanobeam also serves as, as a nanocavity because light can be reflected back and forth here in this comb structure. And this can actually interact with the mechanical vibrations of the system. And they, so now you can actually drive the system at uh, specific frequencies and induce couplings in this synthetic frequency space. And in this way, you can assemble a non-Hermitian chain if it, that exact or exactly the bisonic key type chain that I introduced on the previous slide. So if you drive on at the difference frequencies of these two um, 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 free, uh, vibration modes, then you will induce hopping between those um, different frequencies. Whereas when you drive at the sum of the frequency, um, you obtain two mode squeezing. And in this way, you can exactly um, replicate your chain. But I would also like to stress that this is all just built with one of these nano beams, and it really is a chain that lives in the synthetic frequency uh, space. They, but they have excellent control over the system, and they were able to record the scattering matrix of the, of the system. Um, now, both for the X and the P quadratures, so basically, we now have two copies of the scattering matrix that I showed to you before. Um, so if we want to um, recover the scattering matrix we had before, we should just look at one of these matrix blocks. And in speci specifically, here in the non-trivial case, um, we see this dominant matrix corner, um, which uh, is at opposite ends for X and P, as we would expect, because the um, winding numbers have opposite sign. Then in the trivial case, we see we still have non-reciprocity, but there the, actually the gain drops off exponentially across the system. And then at the transition, the response is essentially flat. Another very interesting question that we investigated in the system is um, how you could use the system to build a sensor. Now, um, sensing has been discussed in this non-emission uh, the context of non-emission topology to some extent, extent because it's, it's, sen it's, it's sensitive to some perturbations. So here in this um, particular example, we had an X chain and a P chain that were decoupled. 
However, now we could imagine introducing a small perturbation, which we can do here in the form of a detuning that we can now sense because this small perturbation couples these two chains now. And so if we inject a signal here, we drive the signal at the first side in the X quadrature, then the signal propagates to the other end, is converted to the P quadrature, propagates back, and then we obtain an output signal. Now, if the, it wasn't for the perturbation, we wouldn't actually obtain an output here, but this is just because of the coupling. So this is very sensitive to the coupling at the last end, and indeed, this, this uh, coupling, um, in, and indeed we obtain um, a very large uh, sensitivity here because first we have the exponential gain in this direction and then in the reverse direction. And this is what this looks like in the experiment. So here, this is the response as a function of detuning um, for different system sizes. This has a theory and experiment on top of each other. So, um, but what you can um, see is if you just focus here on these small detunings, you can see that the slope now changes with system size. And it, in fact, it increases with system size. And um, in fact, if the theory prediction is that it should increase exponentially with system size. And this is precisely what we extracted as this responsivity and plot here. So the blue dots are the experiment and the black line is our theory predictions, not a fit. And we can see that this nicely follows this exponential line. Um, the only um, slight deviation is here at n equals five, which is due to some nonlinear effects, which start to become important. But apart from this, um, it's, it very nicely shows this exponential trend. So here, I would now like just to take a quick break and ask if there are any questions. Um, and then I would have a couple more slides um, if time permits, but I think this is a good, um, the point in time to take questions. We have plenty of time. So oh, we have plenty of time. Yeah. Up to one o'clock where we go to have lunch. We, we still have 25 minutes, so no worries. Okay, so, that's perfect. Any just questions? Just, yeah, just, I have a question. Um, it was very interesting. The, the sensing part, uh, I always wonder what, because what, um, you have this exponentially enhanced sensing which mm -hmm. comes from the uh, topological amplification somehow as you want. Yeah. But um, have you considered time scales for the sensing? Is there any, because very often in this kind of systems, for example, in quantum critical systems, we always find the problem that you have, you get very good scalings for sensitivity, but then if you, if you take into account the time you need for measuring, then mm. it's kind of, the trade-off the trade -off is not very good. So I was wondering whether you have done an analysis like this here. Or... Yeah, that's interesting. I think the time scale in this case is somehow related to the damping that you have in the system because that's what you would need to get. Because basically the way this, the experiment is done, you have a drive, at a, a continuous drive at a frequency and then you extract a response. But the shortest time scale to really get a, rep a representable response uh, is probably something like, one over the decay, uh, yeah, one over the decay rate or something like this. Um, and actually uh -huh. the interesting thing is that, so the gain that you obtained in the system also depends on the decay rate, of course, but it actually, um, but actually uh, it doesn't really, it, it doesn't really matter because if you, you have this exponential growth, so if, uh -huh. while, while, while the gain is exponential, um, yeah, you could just make your decay rate smaller and you would still have the exponential enhancement. That's that's what I'm saying. Yeah, so, well, yeah, it depends. I mean, one has one we need to look at how because yeah. also if you don't have exponential enhancement, but if, if times are very long, you could also get a an improvement of precision just by having long time. Yeah. So but anyways. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just thinking, yeah, I'm just thinking, I think the gain goes with something like lambda, as a, so the the strength of your tumor squeezing, say, divided by gamma to the power of n. So uh -huh. actually, I think if you make your times shorter, actually also the gain goes up. Uh -huh. uh, but this does this make sense? Well, we can maybe keep discussing. It's an interesting question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, maybe I have another question. In mm -hmm. in the in your experiment, uh, yeah. how do you realize the 
the parametric terms, the squeezing ah. terms, let's say. Ah. You, said you are using like a um, tuning some parameter in time, like floquet, or it's more like four-way mixing. Ah, okay. Yeah, so basically, um, so, so basically this is the, um, so basically, yeah, so basically, it's, oh, it's an optomechanical interaction. So you, it's, uh, so you have an interaction of the type, um, you know, A dagger A times uh, X, where X is now the position of your mechanical oscillator. So that's the kind of interaction mm -hmm. that you have. And then you introduce a drive um, in your optical field via your optical field. And, and to get the two mode screening, you would drive at the sum of the frequencies of the different mechanical modes that you want to address. And then when you do a rotating wave approximation and uh, uh, yeah, then you end basically end up um, with the two mode squeezing terms. Mm. Just like three way mixing maybe, or not, yeah. not, not, not the same. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Okay, but you use the sidebands, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, thank you. There is more information in um, on yeah. on the derivation of this in one of the previous papers by um, by Ewald. So if you look at the same uh, authors, uh, it's um, it's a Nature paper where they have a supplementary and they do, do the derivation. I can also send it to you if you're interested. I see. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, I would like to ask you also something about the, the experiment. So I, if I understand well, this is more or less in a classical regime mm -hmm. uh, of the, but is there, is there any way to make it a quantum or, or um, yeah. are, are some way of scaling it up in some way towards the quantum regime? Is this something that people have in mind or? Yeah, I think Ewald is probably the better person to ask about this, but one thing I can ah. say is that this is still at room temperature. So I suppose something could be gained already by putting this into a cryostat. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. But this, this is, at this point, it's still at room temperature. So this would be very classical, as you pointed out. Mm -hmm. I think it's, yeah. Okay, Nance. Okay. So yeah, maybe then we can continue. Um, in the remaining time, I wanted to um, make the connection to another um, very important question in the field of uh, non emission physics and make the connection to this. But I would also like to make the connection to Diego's very nice work on the topic so that we now have a complete picture, essentially. And so one thing that is very much studied in the field of uh, non emission topology is the so called non emission skin effect. Um, so the system that I talked about so far, um, basically I gave you physical recipes to engineer a system that have asymmetric hopping to the right and to the left. And that is what is of typically referred to as Hatano Nelson model in the literature. And this has been extensively studied. Um, and what people found was that um, when the, whenever the spe spectrum admit under periodic boundary condition admits a so-called point gap, meaning that there is a loop in the spectrum, but this loop does not necessarily have to wind around the origin, so it could be anywhere. So whenever the system is point gapped, what you see is that when you look at the eigenvectors of the system, they all localize at one uh, system edge. Now, it doesn't. It, in more general cases, it doesn't have to be all of the eigenvectors, um, but typically there is this connection between this point gapped spectrum, so this is called point gap, and this uh, non-emission skin effect. Now, on the other hand, um, the non-emission skin effect also has been much debated because it actually prevents us from re-establishing a very important result it, that we know from emission topological systems, which is the so-called bulk boundary correspondence. The bulk boundary correspondence relates the topological invariant to the number of localized um, states or, or more generally speaking, eigenvectors. So for example, um, if you have a, a system that a Hermitian system that has a winding number of one, then you would uh, expect that you also get a number of localized states that is somehow related to this winding number. So, for example, if you, if you know this um, SSH model, there you would then get two localized uh, states. But clearly, this does not hold here because here actually all of the states localize. So, um, in the remaining time, I would like to address this question of what is the connection between direction amplification, what is the relation to the non-emission skin effect, and what about the bulk boundary correspondence. Um, and to do this, let's recap what we have so far. So far, I've mostly discussed 
this part here, where we have a non-trivial uh, winding number, and then this is connected to directional amplification. But what we could also see from what I previously discussed is that we have this other case of non-reciprocity, and that occurs when we have a loop in the spectrum, but it is not does not necessarily in, or, in encircle the origin. Then there's a third case where the spectrum degenerates into a line, and then we see reciprocity in the system. Now, this is an if and only if statement if we only have nearest neighbor couplings. If we are if we go beyond that, then um, this is not only not no longer necessarily if and only if. It's a little bit more subtle. We also address this, uh, but for for now, let's keep let's um, just remember this picture. And so now let's plot the eigenvectors, and we can see that actually uh, the eigenvectors here above we find plane waves, so nothing special happens. But in these two cases, as we would expect, we see that the eigenvectors localize. And if we just look at the eigenvectors, it's actually very hard to infer now what happens in terms of the scattering response. Of course, the information is here; it should be in the eigenvector encoded in the eigenvectors as well, but it's just not straightforward to see. Um, and so, and and this should actually not surprise us because we could imagine that we take this spectrum here and we just shift it down so it doesn't encircle the origin anymore. This would lead to a huge change in the scattering matrix, of course. But actually, the eigenvectors wouldn't know about it because we um, they are invariant under diagonal shifts. So the eigen decomposition is actually not the right tool to do this. Um, and here's another reason why these shifts are important for us. So let, let's just think back about and, and think about a me classical mechanical oscillator and we drive this mechanical oscillator. When this mechanical oscillator is strongly damped, then we expect a much weaker response than when it is less damped. On the other hand, if we drive this oscillator on resonance, then we also expect a much larger response compared to when we drive it off resonance. And this is exactly what in, in some sense, this is exactly what we do here when we talk about shifts in the complex plane and for the periodic boundary condition spectrum. And shifting the spectrum is the same as changing gain and loss in the system or changing the detuning in our system or the tuning of the system. And so we see that if we're interested in the scattering response of the system, then the eigen decomposition actually does not capture this. But Diego already found there was, um, the answer to the, what we need to do in order to um, to make the connection to um, this the scattering response. And this, the answer is given by the singular value decomposition, because the singular value decomposition actually establishes a notion of distance from the origin. Under periodic boundary conditions, this is very obvious, because this is essentially just the modulus of the eigenvalue. So it really is the length of this arrow that I draw here. But also more generally, we can think about it in this way. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the singular value decomposition, it is a way to decompose a matrix into two unitary matrices and the di diagonal matrix that contains the singular values. Um, and so, and it is important to say that the left and right singular vectors can differ and they will differ in these uh, systems. And in particular, we obtain the following two relations that define, um, that establish a relation between left and right singular vectors. So when we multiply the right singular vector on the, on the matrix, we obtain the left one. And when we obtain, multiply the left singular vector on the con Hermitian con uh, transpose of the matrix, we obtain the right singular vector, uh, while the singular values are non-negative. And as Diego realized, we can write this in a matrix vector form, and then we actually obtain a Hermitian model again, an eigen um, equation for a Hermitian model. And so we can, I won't go into detail because uh, Diego discusses this very nicely in his paper, um, but we can extract a lot of properties from this Hermitian model and which are now inherited by the singular value decomposition for the non of the non-Hermitian model. Or in other words, we can take a non-Hermitian system, take its Hermitian transpose, and then combine these two systems to obtain a Hermitian system. Now, the submission system, uh, for, it, for in, in the specific case of, this, um, of just having this model, one band model that I discussed so far, you would obtain a Su Schrieffer Heger model, which is a quite well known model in emission topology. This model has two bands, but now for the singular value decomposition, you would only take one band, so one half of this. So, this is very nice connection. And 
uh, now this, this um, now we can come we can fall back to what we know about the bulk boundary correspondence in these systems. In her in her mission systems, there is a bulk boundary correspondence. So if we now have a non-trivial winding number, that would mean that for the singular values, this would mean that under open boundary conditions, we basically obtain the same singular values, except for in this case one singular value that is exponentially small, and that is related to uh, localized singular vectors that localize on the left and right edge. Um, and this is also very nicely connected to the scattering response of the system. We can, because we can expand the scattering matrix in terms of the singular values and vectors, this always works, while the eigen decomposition sometimes uh, has to be, uh, yeah, look, um, has to be uh, used with care. This always works when the matrix is invertible. Um, and so because, because now there is this gap between these localized states and uh, localized singular vectors and uh, the, the bulk, so to say, we can actually say that only those, uh, only those um, localized um, singular vectors contribute, mainly contribute to the scattering matrix, and they give rise to this uh, form of the scattering matrix which I've discussed so far. So in some, so it is basically the outer product of the localized singular vectors, and uh, in other words, we can also say that the winding number tells us how many channels for directional amplification we have in the system. And so if you're interested in in more details about how the, what the singular value decomposition is can be used for, then I would really recommend that you look at Diego's work, um, also his other papers on the matter. But I, I think this very nicely completes this this picture, so that we now have um, um, understood um, how all of these different terms are related, how this how scattering response is related, um, and um, I believe that the singular value decomposition is also a very powerful tool to go forward um, in this in this field. So, so here, this is now the uh, complete picture where we now see that the singular value decomposition nicely now also restores the bulk boundary correspondence, as we can end it nicely, um, only predicts these localized states when it encircles the origin, and this is very closely connected to the scattering response. So when you are interested in doing scattering experiments, then actually the singular value decomposition is, the, is a good tool to fall back on to analyze your system. Um, and with this, I would like to summarize what I've talked about today. First, I talked about this connection between um, non-trivial topology and directional amplification that is also robust in the presence of disorder. I also discussed the, our new uh, experimental results um, in optomechanical systems. I briefly discussed this connection to other concepts such as the non-emission skin effect and um, the singular value decomposition. And what I didn't talk about today, but if you're interested in non-reciprocity, I would um, I would also like to advertise this here. We also looked at um, directionality in systems that do not require break the breaking of time reversal symmetry, also uh, together with the experimental group of Ewald Verhagen. And we also analyzed this in the context of non-emission lattices. So um, if you're interested in this, um, do have a look. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to advertise a seminar series which I'm helping organize. Uh, we haven't actually restarted after Christmas, but um, uh, if you're if you're interested in this, we have a lot of uh, videos also on YouTube already um, with interesting seminars on the in, on the non emission physics. Um, I would also like to change, change, uh, thank my collaborators, um, Andreas, who uh, was my PhD supervisor in Cambridge, his former postdoc Matteo, and the experiment mental team um, in the group of Ewald Verhagen. And with this, I am, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer any remaining questions. Okay, Clara, thank you so much for such a wonderful talk. So now it's time for, for questions. Well, I have some um, questions. So first, thank you for these nice overview of your work. It's a very, very interesting thing. And so like a lot of this, I mean, this, this field is very, uh, it's very, I think it's very interesting. This, all these, uh, also the experiments that you've been doing are also, and actually I, I would like to ask you about specifically 
whether you have been thinking about other experimental implementations in addition to the optomechanical. Well, there was this work recently by by the I think it was uh, Ice Clerk was in, involved with supercomputers oh, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering whether you do you have in mind any any implications of your work, uh, further implications for I mean larger systems larger optomechanical systems or other experimental platforms or? Um, actually, there's another optomechanical experiment that would be probably a very a good a good playground to try these things out, also going, for example, to higher dimensions and so on. So there's this um, work by Tobias Kippenberg. And so far, uh -huh. they've really realized Hermitian topological systems. But I think that this could also be a very nice platform to engineer non-emission lattices because they do have um, they have quite a bit of control over and then they can engineer similarly to here they can engineer two mode squeezing and and so on so because if, if what you want from an experimental platform is for non-emission topology you need basically two ingredients you need a way to engineer non-reciprocity so that means you need some way to get interference so in the first case I showed to you, this interference was this phase that I that I showed you. So it was a interference between paths. But and in the second case with the bosonic key type chain, it was an interference between different processes. It was an interference between tumult squeezing and hopping. So you need you need so you need to be able to uh, engineer either of these. Um, and the third then the other ingredient is you need some source of gain because that is what allows you to ultimately yeah. tackle the origin. So you will need a platform that allows you to do all of these things and to control all of these things, at least to you know a sufficient degree. And that's why I think optomechanics is a really nice platform because it allows you to do all of these things. But for mm -hmm. sure, one can also think about other settings. I mean, if you don't want to necessarily ultimately go quantum, you know, there are also topoelectric circuits. I mean, there you the, the, the maths is actually the same, the mathematics is the same, but the physics are very different. So there you would look at um, there you would look at the at um, impedances rather than you know the scattering response. So you would basically measure a resistance. But the mathematics are very similar. Mm. Um, yeah, but yeah, I mean, if but uh, yeah, for me, optomechanical experiments. Are, I I think these are this is and, and because of, also because of the level of control that um, that people already have. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think for me the challenge is is having quantum effects together with the classical yeah. dynamics because of course everything that happens at the level of a, a dynamical matrix or uh, equations of motion for the coherences in the field is very interesting but it's also I mean is 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 I mean in essence all the physics is there already but it's it's a bit of really nice to go beyond that but of course this is well I, yeah but I mean. Um, I mean, in principle, one could go quantum. Um, be, I mean, up, up in the mechanics, there are experiments that that mm. are in the quantum regime, right? It's just that in this particular experiment, we did it at room temperature. But yeah. in principle, yeah, one one could think one could. It's it's not completely impossible, I think. Yeah, of course. Okay. Anyways, now very interesting work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, by the way, if anyone would like to discuss further, I'm also happy to, uh, to chat um, maybe this week. So if you just send me an email, then and that, that goes uh, to anyone. So if you're interested in chatting, I'm very happy to. Yeah, it's really nice. Actually, I would like to. So I will, because I have more inter more concrete questions and maybe are more yeah. specific. So maybe yeah, we can, we, it's really nice if we meet at some point and keep on chatting on this. It's a very yeah, that's maybe really nice. nice things. Okay, so maybe we have time for a last question. Last chance. <laughs> okay, if not, let's thank Clara again. Uh, so thank you very much, Clara. It was really such a wonderful and clear talk and you really did an amazing job. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation again and hope to meet each other soon in some Congress maybe. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to uh, happy to talk. Uh, yeah, to chat further if anyone's interested. Okay.
Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Clara. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.